Hello, my name is Purity Mora. I am a psychologist and I'm a child safeguarding officer as well. The thing about children, the most interesting thing is they're always, their learning curve is like this, always, always. And they're like sponges that take in everything that the environment throw at them, right? And so when children are in an environment that is high anxiety, high, highly anxious, they tend to soak that in. Why? Because uh, domestic abuse is, is a very traumatic experience. And when children are developing, uh, again, as sponges, they take in everything, they're learning, they're learning, this is the learning curve, they're learning, they're taking everything up. And their development is just not physical. The environment is also very psychological, mental, emotional development. And you get that uh, when they experience domestic abuse, they become very, very anxious. Because they don't know what happens. If you, if, you, if you see what happens during domestic abuse, you realize that one, it might happen tonight, it might not happen, it could get bad tonight, it could not. You, you never know what happens. That uncertainty, that instability can get children to be very, very anxious. Anxiety comes from fight or flight. Are we fighting are we, or are we, are we running away? So when your system is, on, is in constant fight or flight, and there's no point where you're, you're relaxed. What happens is you become very, your system becomes very anxious, you become very nervous. Uh, that's where panic attacks come in, that's where anxiety attacks come in. Understand? <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so it's, it's very, ch children in, in, in homes where there's domestic abuse, they're very anxious and then they become very nervous and and anxiety comes in because even in their behavior okay uh, how it affects them ranges from the f how it affects their physical uh, the, the, the physiology unapata in total they have headaches they have because uh, if if it's domestic abuse sometimes it extends to the to them as well not just the parents the parents get frustrated and beats up maybe their spouse and ends up beats, beating up the, the child. So you can see from the, from the physiology that they have cuts that cannot be explained or, or scratches. You know, their sleeping patterns also is affected. They get nightmares. When I'm katu, you know, when I stuck a usiku, when I shanga, what is happening? But, but they cannot sleep well. Nightmares and that, the, the way they, they get flashbacks. You know, yeah, physically we talk about uh, sometimes when I'm on a tumbo, sometimes when I'm on a kichwa. And, and if there's an illness that is persisting for a long time and they cannot easily uh, explain where it's coming from, okay? Because there are sometimes there are diseases that come from distress that's not exactly physical but more mental, yeah? Um, there's a word for it, I'm forgetting, but there's a word for it. I hope, I, if I remember within this interview, I'm gonna say it. But, but the, the, that's the experience, yeah? So we have physical, then we have emotional, nervousness. Uh, they are, again, anxious. They can even get to, to dep they can even get depressed. Depression is one of the emotional impacts of, of, of that. Um, we also have uh, social impacts where the kid now starts to isolate. They don't want to hang around others. Even when they do, they are, again, they're very highly anxious. They cannot form meaningful relationships. They cannot form long-lasting relationships. And they tend to be very avoidant in social settings. Understand? Yeah, and then we go to cognitive. Cognitive means the processes that happen in the brain. Sometimes, uh, the, the memories, the memories can be very distorted. The way of thought can be very distorted. The way you look at the world, the, your perception of the world is very distorted because of what you, you're going through as a child or what you went through in that setting of domestic violence. Because what you see is that every single person is bad. This means violence. If someone is giving you a high five, you're not seeing a high five coming. You're, you're ready to defend yourself. That is what is happening right there. So even the way you, you interpret things someone says something and though you interpret it is from a glass of of, of violence of, of trauma 
so and then and then we have regression so w if a kid so sometimes a kid starts to bed wet these are behavioral impacts or effects of domestic violence bed wetting um, or, or the kid starts to the, the regressive behaviors yeah like um, about bed wetting, thumb sucking, they start to suck their thumb, so it's like they regress back because they're trying to soothe themselves. Yeah, because when you're in a highly stressful environment, you try to cope. Yeah, and, the, and then we go to our behaviors that are um, regressive, like if, if this kid had experienced a certain uh, skill, they obtained a certain skill or ability. Now it goes back, it's like they do not have it anymore. It comes from motor skills. If they were able to walk, now it's like, I'll go to the now I'm going to because they are experiencing domestic abuse. So it's, it's a very, I'm just throwing it out there in, in point form, but it's a very, the, the effect of domestic violence, whether we like it or not, whether we admit it or not, are very wide. Are, are so many, from the cognitive, we've talked about it, to the uh, behavioral. Children, such children become very aggressive. But I'm a bully when Zaki, I'm a behavior. Mbani, I'm on what the dad or the mom is doing to the other, and then they replicate that behavior. Or they become very isolated, very isolated. They don't want to, because there's a lot of shame and embarrassment. Eh? Kama ni kwa mta, majirani wa mesikia baba kwa kichapwa, ama mama kwa kichapwa. Utatoka nje, uchezo na watu wengine. In fact, some parents say, uschezo na mtoto anani. Don't play with, with so and so's child, because, oh, they have issues at home, oh, they have, you know. Yeah, so it is also a very stigmatizing thing and it can bring a, a, about shame and, and embarrassment, yeah. So, um, as a child is growing, part of the reason why it's crucial for them to be emotionally taken care of and, and mentally and psychologically taken care of is because they are forming their earliest memories. Their cognition is developing physically, everything is developing. And there are different theories of development when it comes to psychology. And one of the, uh, one of the most uh, important in terms of psychosocial development is a guy called Eric Erickson. So he talks about the first stage of being like trust and mistrust. So if this kid develops a sense of, um, of mistrust in, in, the, in the environment, they tend to be very untrusting. They cannot be able to trust the world around them. So if, if, the, if their first or earliest experiences are of that of abuse, because domestic violence is a form of abuse, whether passively or otherwise. Yeah? So if these kids experience abuse at that young age, they tend to be mistrusting. Okay? Then we have um, isolate identity versus role confusion. So that's yeah, that's that's uh, that's not that's uh, like a, a stage in the in the teenagehood. So even if it's a teenager, still they're children. So even even as teenagers, they become confused about who they are. So it also affects their sense of identity. So you'll find that children who are born into homes uh, that have a lot of domestic violence have a, a, a bit of uh, confusion when it comes to one figuring out themselves because what does it mean to be a dad if dad is hitting mom or what does it mean to be this and that you know yeah it's very important it's extremely important that children individuals who've gone through or experienced uh, domestic violence go through some form of support and support includes uh, therapy and there are different forms of therapy that support uh, survivors of domestic abuse. We have trauma for uh, trauma focused cognitive uh, trauma focused cognitive based therapy. Uh, it's TFCBT, and it's basically uh, addressing those issues of the, the trauma that came from the abuse. Yeah, uh, and that involves taking the individual, taking the child through 
thought processes that focus on that experience and to help them change perspective of what that experience means for them because it's cognition. Cognition is about per perception and how you look at things and how you, you remember things and what these things mean to you, how you interpret them. Yeah, we also have uh, mindful interventions where we talk about relaxation techniques. This is mostly to help in coping. Uh, when you're, when a child who's gone through or experienced domestic abuse, most of the time um, they're very anxious, yeah, as we said. So these mindful techniques means we are, we are being present. Mindfulness means being present and when you're present you're not in your head because a lot of the time you'll be in your head thinking about all those terrible things that happened and you need to get out of your head and come to reality and feel the grass feel feel the air and see the colors you know so we have different techniques that help with that and just being uh, meditation and all that uh, you know and then we have behavioral therapy because uh, as we said it, it impacts the behavior of the child so th uh, therapy that helps better the behavior of the child if the child was aggressive or if the child was, was isolating asana you know something to help with that we also have family therapy because because it's very important that the whole family comes together right um, what else we have we have uh, the parent-child interaction therapy because now when a child sees their parent hit or being hit that does something to you as a child that's heavy so it, even the perception you have of your parent can be very distorted you know uh, because of that experience so once you're together in a room and there's a therapist and they are taking you through a session you can be able to see uh, see your parent in a different way and experience them in a different in a different way yeah so those are we have group therapy as well so that you don't feel alone yeah so there are different interventions that help those are just um, a few i've mentioned but there's, there's a whole range of interventions and therapies that uh, help, help help can help children yeah uh, we also have uh, therapies that help in expression because Children who go through domestic uh, violence, abuse, they tend to keep to themselves and not really speak out because they're afraid. They, are, they live in constant fear. Because what happens when you express yourself? Somebody is going to hit you. And we understand from that perspective of domestic violence, someone's right of expression is, is being put down, right? So to help the child communicate and express themselves and even talk, uh, we usually use art-based interventions like um, art therapy yeah? yeah, and also play therapy. Play therapy helps a child uh, express themselves as they play and, and also to just release those emotions because play therapy ensures for number one a safe environment for the child. Yeah. Creative therapy for expression. Uh, because when we go back to the cre uh, cognitive impacts, children who have undergone domestic violence tend to see a, wi a world of violence, as, as we said. So even when they are drawing, they, they will use a lot of red to danger, uh, um, blood, uh, you know, hazard. Yeah, so, so the, you will see, one of the ways, if you're a teacher, if you're, a, if you're someone who's interested in matters of children, one of the ways to know what, I, what is happening in the mind of a child is through art therapy. Give them, just give them and let them draw anything, how they feel, yeah? And you will notice the colors they use, the shapes they use, what they're drawing can really bring you, take you into that mind of the child. Without that child exactly, speaking you know yeah so uh, art therapy play therapy are great ways to help the child express themselves in a creative way and give them that safe environment as well yeah how to create a safe environment I think it's important that you make the child know that it's open communication it's not easy because that's not it's that's a foreign concept to them so if you're going to have a conversation with a child who's gone through domestic uh, violence or experienced it passively, one, open communication. Let them know that the environment is safe. 
take, in fact, don't have that conversation in the in that space where they went through that abuse. Take them out of that of that place. It's uh, physically safe. Though you talk to them, make sure that your language is child friendly so that it doesn't feel like jargon or this complicated language because that will be very intimidating. And already they're very anxious. Even to think or talk about it, it's something that they'd rather forget or throw it back. But now you want to have a conversation with them. So make sure they, they very well know yeah, that it's safe. And though you talk to them, the tone you use, your body language as well. Yeah. Um, so that's one of those to create a safe environment for this child. Let them know that you're a safe space for them and they can talk to you. Yeah, so as, in, as the individual who's decided to take this up, uh, you have to do a lot of the work because the children are in like a shell. Yeah. A lot of the times uh, when children go through this abuse, they feel like they are, their feelings are not, they shouldn't feel these feelings, right? Uh, they feel guilty about their feelings. And this happens to a lot of people who, are, who have undergone trauma. Validate those feelings. Validate them, ensure that you have told them whatever you feel is very valid and people feel like this. One of the reasons why group therapy is important is it shows that you're not the only one going through this. You have, so it, it's a validation process. Group therapy is a validation process, yeah? And also um, just ensuring that they're able to have choices, that they can be able to express themselves in so many ways. It's not just through talking, they can draw. So you're providing these options for these children. So that also makes them feel, feel some form of safety and autonomy and control. Because uh, I usually talk about the five psychological needs that every single person needs. Like the way we need water, the way we need food, the way we need clothes on our back. We talk about uh, the psychological need of safety. It's very crucial emotionally. Psychologically, we need to feel safe. We need to trust. We need to have our esteem. So you find children having gone through uh, domestic abuse, their self-esteem is extremely low. Yeah? Then we have intimacy needs, where we feel bonded or connected with the people around us, or those people who are important to us. And then the psychological need of control. Whenever we feel like we do not, do not have control over our environment, over the issues in our lives, we feel helpless and hopeless, and that's where depression comes in, right? Yeah, so it's very important to give these children a sense of control and autonomy by giving them these options. And also, stability. Stability is very important because we say these children don't know when war is going to break out. They're always, they're always on, the, on the lookout what is going to happen next. So if you give them like routine, like a way of, like a stable, you know, and, and explain to them, so this is what we're going to do here, from here this is what's going to happen. So they can already know what is going to happen in the next 30 minutes, in the next hour, they can be able to at least predict. It gives them that, again, sense of control and sense of relaxation. They can be able to calm down because they're not anxious again. Yeah, so um, these are just one, some of the ways um, we can be able to create a safe environment for these children. And also just because, again, the academics, if they're in school, the academics will most definitely be affected. So uh, getting uh, them to be safe at school and having a conversation with their teachers, if you're a parent, uh, having a conversation with their teachers and finding inter school-based interventions can be a great way to in uh, uh, intervene while they are in school because they can still get anxious in school. Yeah. Okay, uh, also these children haven't seen anything like what a, a healthy relationship looks like. So exposing them to a different way of, of thought in terms of letting them see better role models, letting them see an environment where there's not chaos. is a good way to just let them know this is not what the world is about. There's much, much more to it. And also you're just modeling good behavior so they can also replicate it. Yeah. So are boys affected more than girls? Uh, Aff the effects, uh, boys affected more than effects are, are the same, I would say, because, because we have this where boys are more violent, they become violent, say spouses or um, aggressive, girls tend to choose aggre uh, 
bad partners or terrible partners, yeah. Uh, but the thing is, it's, it's on the same scale. Why I feel it could take a bigger toll on the boys is because it's less likely for men to go for therapy. It's less likely for men to express themselves. It's less likely for them to talk about the issues that they went through. Or, or they'd rather put it at the back of their minds and forget that it happened and just move on with life. Compared to girls, you know, where we're about self-care, let's talk about things, you know, let's go for therapy, you know. But it's, it, that, that's why it would, it, we would put it like that, that it affects boys more. It doesn't affect boys more. It's just that the aftermath is, is, is bigger. The impact on them is bigger because of what happens after the trauma. Yeah, so that, that would be the main difference. The, the scale is the same on the effects, but then how it impacts the, them, especially in the future, is what is different because of the societal expectations we've put on men. Men shouldn't cry, men shouldn't express, them. you're supposed to be strong, and all that shenanigans that are not true. They're not true, it's all made up. It's all, it's all a world of make-believe if you think about it. The truth is, everyone is human and everyone expresses themselves in different ways and everyone should be led to express themselves whether you're male or female or whatever you think you are you know you should just be able to express yourself yes um every single person everyone needs to at least go for therapy that's what i need to say because we might assume that we're okay because we are high functioning we are going to work we are but then where the rubber meets the road is when we start to form relationships or when you get triggers. Don't wait for the trigger. Don't wait for it. Sometimes the way we go for physical checkups, oh, what am I feeling physically? Go for psychological checkups as well. I think it's very important. Yeah.